Are you guys ready for this? Are you ready for Thanksgiving? Uh, uh, If you're like us, uh, I don't know, I can't speak for Pastor Phil, but I think it was announcing pie and praise that made us go, (laughs) (laughs) that it's already upon us. Uh, And I think it's this way, uh, life can be so busy that sometimes um, we get caught up in the day-to-day and the seasons kind of avalanche upon us. And yet we are glad that we have this moment uh, to be able to come together. And in some ways, this Sunday is like every Sunday. We come together to give thanks to God. We come together with grateful hearts for a God who loves us and gives us this opportunity to worship him. And uh, yet it's different because it is at least a major focus throughout our country to take a moment and realize that there is an opportunity to give thanks, and uh, we should be a thankful, uh, if all people on the planet should be thankful for freedom, it should be our country, it should be our people, and if there's anybody on the face of the earth that should be grateful, it should be those who are followers of Christ. And I want to, you know, this is not a Thanksgiving message, uh, but I want to tell you that I, it's my belief that all of us to know the Lord, understand the doctrine of thanksgiving. Let's take our Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Yes, you heard 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And that's because this is not the message. This is all free. Let's read verses 16 through 18 out loud. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Always like to help people find those books that are Sometimes maybe not where you know where they are, so start in Genesis and keep going right. (laughs) Or start in Revelation and go back, I don't know, whichever way. Some of you have this passage memorized, you know these verses, but let's read them together as a church family as a way of giving thanks to the Lord. Let's worship the Lord in this reading out loud together. Would you join me? Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Does it help you? Does it help you to take a moment and recognize that God tells us to rejoice evermore? Do you have reasons to rejoice today? Do you? And we hope you do. It doesn't mean that all of life's easy. Matter of fact, uh, you know, I I appreciate that there is within this assembly uh, a great measure of being here through difficulty. Um, There are many people struggling, and yet here you are today. And here you are, and I'm I'm glad to say, and and by the way, some people, have you ever heard of people uh, criticize people for coming to church and putting on a fake smile? You ever heard people like, oh, they're a hypocrite, you know, because here they put on this smile, and I know everything's not good in their life. You know what? Uh, Rejoicing sometimes is a decision, And it really is a focus of what God has done for us. But I would say that as you look at this passage, uh, rejoicing evermore, this next phrase, pray without ceasing, I would argue that each one of these verses are really about fellowship with God. And that's really what we've come together to do this morning, to fellowship with him through his word in obedience to his spirit. And I think when we do that, he causes rejoicing. I kind of think of it, I forget what they're called, um, Am I right? My wife's not in here. You other gardeners are going to have to help me. It's, uh, aren't they California poppies? Is that what they're called? That in, in the morning you go out and they're kind of, they're kind of balled up into their little bulb. But as the sun hits them, they open. Am I talking about the right flower? Many flowers, I guess, are that way. But, but it, it's, I think that, I think coming together worship, to worship the Lord and giving thanks go together in that fashion, that as we begin to rejoice and think about him, as we pray with him and talk with him about what's going on in our lives and focus on him, I believe he kind of opens us up like that flower and it becomes a natural aroma of the Christian's life to give thanks and even hard things. Next verse, verse 18, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I think the blessing of that is knowing that you can do the will of God this morning. You can do the will of God in giving thanks right where you are. And I do want to encourage you that uh, as, as I kind of wrap up just this, just this moment to help us as a church family embrace the Thanksgiving season and to get our minds oriented into that, 
Uh, I want to say that all of us as believers are challenged to give thanks, right? And I think that many of us look at giving thanks as some kind of uh, major spiritual advice that God gave that this is something that is a duty of believers to do. Now, I don't want to get outside of the idea that God does give these as imperatives or as commands, but I want to tell you that I think it is far more than just advice. I really believe that the wisdom of God is behind these verses. And I think it's when you go through really difficult times that you understand uh, the power of thanksgiving, the power of what it means to be able to take your circumstance and to give God thanks for it. I'm going to use Phil and Gene's song as I'm listening to the words. Uh, I think it said, uh, thanks and joy and thanks and sorrow. Really? How do you do that? And I would tell you that it's, I think it's impossible if it isn't for the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. But here's what you can take comfort in. That is the work of the Holy Spirit that brings you to a place of thanksgiving, even in sorrow, even in hardship. So right here this morning, you know, uh, it was dicey whether Phil and Jean were going to be able to sing because we've got physical things going on that aren't easy. Uh, we've got surgeries that have just been gone through. People are here. Uh, uh, and then, uh, again, uh, just life. Bad things happening in the week. But here you are. And in this place, we get to set the stage for giving thanks. I think that uh, giving praise or giving thanks is a lot like pie. Uh, there are good things in this life. And God is good to us in many ways. And uh, we take opportunity to look for those good things, but also to give thanks for them. And so tonight we do want you to come in the spirit of that song and in the spirit of these passages, come with an opportunity to give thanks. And I would argue this for you, even if there's been difficulty in your life, I would say that many times it's in that difficulty that God magnifies his power and his strength. So I hope that you can come tonight with the opportunity to praise him and use that opportunity to magnify the Lord. We're going to be now in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're looking at the reality of ministry. The reality of ministry, this is our second part. Uh, I'm going to kind of crescendo up into this message by saying, first of all, I want to give thanks to you as a church family to your ministry to the Petiti family. They were here this last week. So we were in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 a couple weeks ago. Going to come back into it today. But with the Petitis here last week, they shared their ministry in Springville, 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 Utah. And um, I wanted to encourage you over the blessing that you were to them in an offering. Uh, It's really, it has become a habitual joy uh, for us as pastors to be able to hand them the check that you guys gave. Uh, The check you gave was $2,600, and uh, Jory's words immediately were, that's the biggest offering they've ever received. And that's good and bad at the same time. I would love to see that to be even greater. I'd love to, I'd love to, I'd love to hear them say, you know, that's nowhere close to the biggest offering we've ever received. Uh, but we're glad that you were a blessing to them. Thanks for ministering to them. And as we come into this chapter, the segue there is this. Look, you, and I'm not simply lifting up the patities. I'm just saying anytime, let's draw back out of this for a second. Uh, you know that Pastor Phil and I uh, went with some teenagers, did a college tour, looking for laborers to going to the harvest. And, and we're kicking off our Christmas offering here tonight. We're going to talk more about that, particularly next week. But really, all of the Christmas offering this year is going to go into the gift of laborers. And what that means is investing in those that are going into the ministry full time. And as we were traveling, what a joy it was for me to be able, and for Pastor Phil to be able to sit across from people who were surrendered to give their life to go serve. And it really was a blessing, and I, I, can't, I can't magnify this any more to you except, except for to uh, share my heart. It was a blessing to reach across the table, shake that hand, and say, we want to help you. We want to help you find your way in ministry. And, and by the way, every time I preach or talk about these things, I, I'm not neglectful to remember that God has called all of his children to be servants. Amen? So we're all to serve. We also recognize that in this world today, there is a declining 
uh, number of those going into full-time ministry, ministry to serve either as missionaries or pastors or sometimes teachers in Bible institutes and colleges to help train and do the ministry. So much so is that the case that you're having more and more churches not able to find pastors and more and more the norm that churches are closing their doors. As I started this passage this morning, I want to tell you that Tuesday night I shared with the church family, it was only Tuesday. It was only Tuesday. And in that time, I had already talked to two pastors that were struggling in their ministries. Um, And when they talked to me about what was going on, uh, would you like to know what the common theme was? Here's the common theme, fighting within the church and the pettiness of power struggles within the church. And the fruit of that is, I'm not kidding. The fruit of that is that these pastors, you know what's what's gonna happen to these guys? They may feel an overwhelming sense, and here's the phrase, that it's time to move on. And some of these churches looking at closing their doors and not existing any further. And, and, and what I'm saying is, look, we need faithful people of God to stand on the word of God. And that's not just pastors, it's the people, right? I can guarantee you, if you were to ask both of these pastors that I spoke to, all they would want is for their people in their body to do the right thing. So a pastor can do the wrong thing as well. It's a partnership of a body joined together for the cause of Christ out of love for Christ to do the work of Christ. That's what we're called to do. Now all that is an introduction (laughs) into 2 Corinthians chapter 6. All right. Here we are in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And as we look at this, we picked up, we are going to pick up in verse 3, just as a reflection over where we've been. Commentaries uh, talk about these chapter or these verses being nine sets of nine. Uh, things that uh, were the trials or what Paul deals with at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of this chapter. Verse 3, giving no offense in anything, the reality of the ministerial life My life matters in the world around me because the world is looking at my life and the message I carry. And his point is, I want to be careful in my life not to do anything that's going to take away from the message that God has given. That message that we just looked at in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 is the message of reconciliation. So giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, And in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in these things, in much patience. Now, the idea of patience, again, being able to endure all of these things. So, is the ministry easy? Well, listen to the descriptives that he gives here. In afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, and in fastings. Now, I've already preached through each one of these things, and not to come back and do them again, but in each one of these things, we would all identify those as trials and hardships. And here's the thing. We need lay people to be able to stand under the authority of the Word of God in the world around you with a backbone so that you don't faint in the, ta- in the time of trial. That you stand on the authority of who God is and your testimony as a minister of Christ, one who stands uh, behind the word of God, that your life reflects that truth, even when there is trial. Now, I would say, listen, folks, you and I need to not be alarmed if America falls more and more under uh, a cloud of darkness where there begins to to be oppression uh, upon Uh, the body of Christ. Now, by the way, uh, I don't know that this is so, maybe you're going to have to affirm this for me. Uh, People have said this. I just don't know if it's true. Uh, I understand that uh, people have been putting posts on Facebook that have verses that have God's name in it, and then they get blocked. Is that true? At least according to some of you, it's true. 
Does it surprise you? Does it anger you? Well, be angry and sin not, okay? Uh, and, and maybe maybe it's, uh, by the way, I think a lot of pastors start, and I, I understand it. There's probably a lot of pastors saying, bless God, get off of Facebook. And there might be some worth in that. Um, but I'm just saying that this world is going to do what unsaved people do. And, and what happens, instead of Christians throwing a tantrum, we need to stand in our relationship with Christ and look like him, even when there's trial. And by the way, I'm not saying that, that it's a good thing that uh, Facebook is doing that, but I, I somewhat think that that doesn't fall to the measure of what we just read. Are, are, are we all agreed? I mean, look at this. Oh, Facebook is blocking my verse. Well, I, I get it. I don't like it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. But here you have in all these things in afflictions, necessities, distresses, stripes, imprisonment, tumults, labors, watchings, fastings. Maybe God will do in this country for his glory what needs to be done and allowing darkness to come harder upon this country that the light might shine. I don't know what God's going to do there. But all I'm saying is, look, when Paul's talking about these things, you and I need to understand that those who have surrendered to serve the Lord are going to face difficulty. And I think it's good for us to settle in our minds right now. When that comes, I am going to stand for Jesus. Make a decision now. Make a decision in your character and in your walk with Christ that you're not going to let the ministry be hindered even if you go through a hard thing. Do you realize that God may put you in prison so you can speak about Jesus? Do you realize that your home is not the most important thing that you have on this planet and that God may move you so you can speak about Jesus to someone that needs to hear about him from you? Do you know that God may allow great and what we might think is cataclysmic things happening to our life to take us from one place to put us in another so that he would use us to speak Jesus to someone that needs to hear about him through this vessel he has made. So it isn't about comfort. It isn't about ease. It is about the ministry that Paul says, and, he, and I'm just bringing the reality check. The reality of ministry is that ministry can be hard. So is that true? Well, yes, it is. Let me ask you, do you think I've ever faced hardships with God's people? Do you think God's people have always been easy? I appreciate the spirit of what my pastor says of his own church, and I think it's very much true here. When I get around other pastors who are complaining about their, their church, I kind of have to start making stuff up. <laughs> we are blessed. Pastor Phil and I will say, and we haven't written a card to say to the church, but pastor's appreciation just happened. Thanks, thanks for allowing us to minister with you. Uh, and I'm going to just say here, while the ministry does express all these things that Paul has said, I have not gone through the things that Paul's talking about in large degree. I have not. In large respect, I've been the beneficiary of a time of peace and of God's good people. You, you have been a blessing to labor with. But should and if the ministry ever be hard, we better decide before it gets hard that we're going to stand for the Lord and do the work of God anyway. Amen. Paul ministered in those things. Now, I think it's interesting in our King James, it doesn't always bear out in other translations um, this, this kind of, a, uh, of a, a distinction. But you have in these things, in, in uh, these verses, you have in and in and in. So in stripes and imprisonments. But in verses six and seven, we have a means by which we minister. 
So he ministers in these situations, but now he also says, I minister by these tools or through these means. So the effect of what we're going to go into right now is a consideration of God's people on how am I going to minister. So everybody with me? What I want to challenge you with this morning through these verses, because it's what they relay, is the how you're going to do what God has called you to do. And it uses this little word, by. So, Paul ministered by means of the following methods or tools or empowerments that God gave. I'm going to read through them. We'll come back and talk about them. He says, by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. Now, as we break down, how do I serve? I hope this morning that you will take some notes, not that what I'm going to say is rememberable, but by what is given here that maybe God will help you use these things to open the door of ministry in your own life on the how do I serve? How do I serve? So remember that the overarching theme that Paul is carrying is, I am a minister of the message of the, of the reconciliation of Christ. I am the one as an ambassador who gets to tell the world around me how to be reconciled to God. And now he's going to go through arguing and in the life of the minister, all that a minister might go through, but now the means by which he can carry out that ministry, not only by the means by which he can, but by the means in which he did. So as we walk through these, each one of these actually could be a message unto itself. But we're going to walk through. When Paul says, I ministered in the following means, what does he mean to relate to us? He starts by pureness. This is similarly what he's mentioned above where he talks about the ministry not being blamed. By living a life of purity around him, and purity simply meaning by cleanliness, uh, by cleanliness of life, by a blameless life, he's lived a life of purity. I want to come back and say to you folks again, whether we like to acknowledge this or not, one of the greatest hindrances to ministry is an impure Christian life. When you are not walking with God, you are not going to serve him. When you're not walking with him in a way that loves him, you're going to have great difficulty ever caring about the work of God. So he says, I have to be real about my walk with God. And because I love him, it affects the way in which I approach this life. And for the believer, that means that we actually care about purity. We care about who we're representing. We care about the, the one that we're telling the world about. And as we're telling the world about him, there should naturally be a purity to the life of the believer. Now, I've got a question for you. Is there an amen on that? I'm asking because I'm telling you that much of Christianity, I think, today divorces itself from this idea. It's no big deal. But Paul is arguing over the life of the minister, and he's saying, look, my life does need to reflect the purity of God. And the purity of God, by nature, doesn't look like the world around us. Is that true? Now, we don't separate ourselves from the world by not looking like the world just because we're trying to put on a standard. That is not the point. The point is, you love Jesus, and by loving Jesus, he changes the way that you approach the world around you, and this is what it looks like, purity. So Christians, you and I need to be careful about allowing things in our lives that aren't impure or that aren't pure that can somehow reflect negatively back on the gospel. For the life of the believer is going to be reflected in the message. He says, secondly, he says, by pureness, but he also says, by knowledge. Now, knowledge is simply a broad term. 
It's a broad term, but I will argue that this is something that are on Tuesday nights that we've been covering in 2 Peter chapter 1. Does God want you to know him? Yes. He wants you to know him as your savior. Is that all he wants to, you to know? Hello? No. He wants you to know his character, his truth, as represented throughout all of scripture by knowledge. Now what that means, believer, are you ready? Hello. You and I need to know some things doctrinally. Amen? You and I need to know, listen families, we can't just simply teach um, truth to our families and not have an interpersonal relationship with them where we are exploring that truth and what it means in real life. Now, I'm going to tell you something about what I've experienced in my own family. Uh, now, I'm going to ask you, do you think I've tried to raise my kids to love the Lord? You'd be right. Have we been perfect? Careful how you answer that. No, we have not been perfect. But there's something that happens with every one of our kids that we do not alarm ourselves by, but we know it's there. Every time a get, uh, one of our young people gets to be that 17, 18, 19, 20, right in that time frame, guess what they're doing? They're evaluating, are these my beliefs? Now, we have tried and tried and tried to help them establish that before they get to that stage of life. But regardless, it comes, and here's the point. They have to know what the Bible says. They have to know who God is. Because just, just because your parents do something is not going to be the enduring power that allows them to stand in the midst of difficulty. They have to know God themselves. And here's what we can say, not just in the, in the world of children growing up to be adults, but we can say it in the world of adults. I'm telling you that there are many people who have a lack of knowledge of God in a way that, it, it, it's not friendly to say, but it, in a way that is shameful. You and I need to be growing in our knowledge of God. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, you don't have to turn there, but that verse is a famous verse that has purity latent within the verse. It says, but sanctify the Lord God, if you remember the phrase, in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you, a reason of the hope that is in you with, remember how it says it, with meekness and fear. The idea is that we can give a reason for why we do what we do, why we believe what we believe. And, and, and Matt, listen, listen. I, I know I've said this in, in years past. I, this is crazy to me, okay? But I had a believer that was in this church uh, for some years and then left the church and then went to a charismatic church and came back to this church. And here was their statement. I don't know why we've got to be so concerned about doctrine. And I, I, I hear that, I'm like, what planet are you living on if you're saying you're a believer in Christ? And no wonder that the ministry that they're in is all about emotions and feeling. Do you think you can trust your emotions and feelings? I'm telling you what, it's like, it's like nailing doctrinal jello to the wall. It's pathetic. It does no enduring, has no enduring strength or power. It's the doctrine of the word of God that has power. And listen, I, I tell our Sunday school class, I say it often, I, am, I know that you have an expectation. And regardless of your expectation, which I agree with, I want to know God and know him well. But I am not a walking Bible encyclopedia. I'm glad for the resources and tools that I have. I'm sad over the weakness of mind that can't remember things the way I used to. And I'm even more sad that I learn things that I, at some point I learn something and I'm like, oh, I used to know that. <laughs> My point is we all need to be students of the word of God. We all need to be growing in our knowledge because it is our knowledge of God that we're carrying to the world around us. So you want to know how to minister? Live a pure life that reflects your relationship with Christ. Know him and grow in your knowledge of him. Don't be satisfied that you are where you are. Keep growing. And if you want to know how to grow, disciple somebody. Amen, amen.
Disciple somebody. You're going to grow. Disciple somebody. Point somebody who doesn't know him to knowledge of him. It goes on. You want to know how to minister further? Have some long suffering in your life. What does that mean? What does it mean to have long suffering? It means to put up with a lot. I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Some children and teenagers, I'm sure others as well. In other words, do some of you have the gift of ornery? That gift is in our house. I'm pretty sure it came from my mother-in-law's side. <laughs> of the. But if you... I don't even know where this, I don't know where this song comes from, but our family breaks into song once in a while, and I've never heard it before until they start, but it, it, it says something like that. How does it go? My mother and father, how's it go? My mother Yeah, my mother and father are ornery. My mother and father are ornery. And I don't, how's it end? <laughs> so I am ornery too. Okay. This is what that looks like. This is what it looks like. I'm in the house, and one of someone, and I cannot be accused of using any of my single children as an illustration that are present in the room. Because most of the time when I'm talking about them, I'm talking about the conglomerative mess of them. And what I mean by that is I'm in the house, and the next thing I know, Someone is doing something, and whether it's, whether it's saying something, or sometimes singing it, or sometimes doing something, and they start doing it over, and over, and over, and over, and, and, and do you parents ever feel whatever that is rising in you? So it's like, it's rising, it's rising, and I think... Endure. It'll stop soon. I do. I mean, I'm like, it's right there at that boiling point. And it's like, sometimes it actually stops right when I'm right there. And I'm like, <sighs> other times I go into dad mode and very graciously I say, stop it. And it's usually at that moment that I realize it was a ploy all along because they stop and they go, hey, hey, hey. (laughs) Right? (laughs) That is not a spiritual gift. (laughs) But long suffering means putting up with a lot, it's forbearing. So listen, folks. Uh, I, I, I know that maybe these aren't things that you came to church to hear, but listen, Christians, your anger needs to be under control. My anger needs to be under control and surrender to the Lord. And especially, I don't think there's one area that you can say that, but especially as it regards the lost. You know what, Christian? You know what, you know what the world sees in many Christians? And we, and we make it all about us. It's about Jesus. We got to have some long suffering in us. And, and, I, and by the way, is, I, I don't think anybody in this room is going to say, I've got an A plus in that class of long suffering. Because sure as you say you get an A plus, you're going to blow up in front of everybody somewhere. Right? So I just know that it's something that's done on purpose. You can minister by and through these means, by purity, by a knowledge, and by long-suffering, and you will almost always find long-suffering coupled with something else, and it's in the very next word. Long-suffering and, what's the next word? By, say everybody together at the same time, one, two, three. Kindness. Kindness. Any of you parents ever tell your children just flat out, Straight up, be kind. Hello, anybody else? Be kind. Do you think that's relegated to just children? Nope. Nope. It's all of us, right? Kindness 
is simply that. It's an exhibition of benevolence, an exhibition of love. It is what we try to minister in our fellowship before, middle, and after the service. We try to minister a kindness to the banner of the love of Christ. You find this most specifically in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, where it says uh, charity, love does two things. It suffers, that's long-suffering, and is kind. (laughs) Sometimes these messages are a little bit too real even for my comfort. I have huge respect for people that can drive around with Bible verses on their cars. (laughs) There's a reason I don't have Bible verses on my car. (laughs) I'm not sure that my car is sanctified (laughs) or the driver behind it. But here we are, right? Here we are. This is reality. If anybody on the planet should be kind, who should it be? The Mormons? I'll tell you what, there's a lot of Christians embarrassed by Mormons. Now, I'm going to tell you that Mormons do it for a wholly different reason. But the reason you and I have to be kind is greater. We're the beneficiaries of God's kindness and we demonstrate God's kindness to the world around us so that we can let them know of the kindness of our Savior. There should be no better neighbor on the planet. There should be no better co-worker on the planet. There should be no one that exhibits kindness more than you. Now, that is one thing to say it. But that, that ministry needs to have its place in our grumpy old men, our grumpy old other people, (laughs) and our grumpy whoever. Kindness needs to win. Amen? Kindness needs to win. And sometimes we give ourselves far too much latitude to not be this. And I'm, I, I'm, I mean, and I mean it for me too. I believe there's more power in this than we know. And I think we look at lists like this and we say, well, that's a good suggestion. And that's a good suggestion. Well, that's a nice thing. I I believe it's far more powerful than that. But this will never happen if we don't reconcile these truths to our character because of Christ. It goes on to say, and again, I think so many of these things intermingle, intermingle together by... Pureness by no, by excuse me by pureness by knowledge by long suffering by kindness by the Holy Ghost. Now, because of the emphasis of the Word of God and how that's been applied in this ministry, it's hard for me not just to park on this for the rest of the service. But the Holy Spirit is the one that enables you to minister. Stop looking for someone else to equip you to serve. The Holy Spirit is the best administrator of your service. So what it means is living life surrendered and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. What that means is as you wake up in your day, you surrender to the Lord and say, I am yours. How do you want to use me? Lord, may I serve you? Show me what to do. And there's a world around you that needs Jesus. So let the Holy Spirit guide you. Let the Holy Spirit be your enabler. Let the Holy Spirit be your director. Let the Holy Spirit be the one that gives you the focus and the direction you need. But when he does, do it. Live in that surrender to the Spirit to serve as God enables you. Now, folks, I want to... 
say something again. I've been saying this a long time, and I think I'm saying it because I'm, I'm still trying to do this myself. I want to grow in doing this. I want to be a disciple maker. I want to help others know more about Jesus. But all you have to do is, Lord, who do you want me to minister to? Lord, would you give me somebody to disciple? Would you give me somebody that wants to know about you? Maybe you'll give me the opportunity to do a Bible study. Maybe you'll help me start a men's coffee group or a men's a pie group and co- pie and coffee group. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, I just felt inspiration. <laughs> Let the whole, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, uh, sometimes I get tickled. So, all right. So, let the Holy Spirit do this. Let the Holy Spirit lead you to serve. Amen? Let him do it. It goes on to say, with love and faith. Now, this is important. Okay. I, I know it's so easy to read a word like this and get past it. Love unfeigned. Well, let's just break it down for a moment. What does love unfeigned mean? It means to love somebody sincerely without putting it on. Without being, there's another word we use, without being something, without being fake. So this is often described by many as saying, and I think Jory just said it last week, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So you know why I think many times we don't disciple people? Because it takes energy, it takes work, and it takes getting involved in a messy life. It takes time. That's why I think the Lord didn't call you to win the world. He called you to win one by one. And one person to disciple may be all that you can handle. After all, aren't you a handful of yourself? But as we look at this, this love unfeigned means a love that is transparent, a love that is sincere, a love that is clear and true. You're not doing this to get something out of somebody. You're not doing this to you know, somehow improve yourself. You're just loving somebody. So does the world need to see the love of God? Yes. And the ambassador that he's given to display that is you. He says, by the word of truth. What is he talking about in the word of truth? What's he talking about? What's the word of truth? It's your Bible. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, when we talk about the word of truth, listen, folks, we want, isn't it true that we all want to be right? Do you want to be right? I hope so. I, I, I haven't gotten my mind around somebody that says, yeah, I just want to be wrong. <laughs> I know you think you're married to somebody like that, but you're not. They probably want to be right, and they probably think they are. And this is such a difficult thing. This is such a difficult thing. Because you are faced with people all around you that have different opinions than you. And I often say to people, look, I just think this is where we go. I think many times we look at somebody else's position, and we just kind of throw down the line, well, you're wrong. We make the declaration where well, you're wrong and, and we get entrenched in our position. And it's funny how often our entrenchment doesn't look like Jesus when it comes to loving people. It all of a sudden starts looking like a position. And now we're angry and now we're fighting. And uh, the Bible has a lot to say about those kinds of things. You and I need to stand on the word of God with sincerity and humbly and love people in the process. And I don't think that means you excuse bad doctrine, but you can stand against bad doctrine without hating people around you. But you and I also have to be willing to let the word of God say what it says and not bend it to suit our dogma or suit our doctrine. Let the word of God stand. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, he's talking about the ministry of reconciliation here. Seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, what does he say? We 
faint not. Not going to give up on this. Not going to quit. But have renounced the hidden things of, next word. We've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in what? Craftiness is the idea of being sneaky. And it goes on to say, nor handling the word of God, how? Deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. This verse, again, is linking the importance of the messenger and the message, but here's the spirit of it all. The spirit of it all is I just want to land on the truth of what the Bible says. Now, big red flag, you don't, you need to be careful about trusting people who preach the word of God. You need to be careful. Uh, I, I, it's something that's out there that I can't, I, uh, you know, I certainly don't want to uh, uh, impose upon our church that this is the only place that you're going to hear, hear sound doctrine. I want this to be a place where you hear sound doctrine, but I am opening the door to say you need to be careful about who you're listening to in the world around you. There are all kinds of people trying to make a buck off of God's people. And willing to elevate doctrine to suit their position to do so. I believe the study of the word of God and the study of doctrine will prevent you from getting to that place. But my point is, you and I have to be in the word of truth. And we have to tell the word of truth because it is the truth of God that changes people. We don't want to win them to our persuasion. We don't want to win them to our logic. We want the word of God to reign supreme going to end with these last two. Our time is really done. It says in these last two in verse eight, it says by, um, by the word of God, excuse me, verse seven, by the, uh, by the word of truth, by the power of God and by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. When we minister under the power of God, what that means, it is God that is doing the work of the ministry through you. And I don't know that we'll get to the last part of the armor of righteousness, but take your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. We've been covering this on Tuesday nights, so it's going to be familiar territory for those that have been listening on Tuesday nights. So listen, folks. The work of the ministry needs to stand <clears throat> on the power of God. It needs to stand on the working of God and not our manipulation. So I say that because it is the power of God that enables us to serve. It's the power of God that's working in us. We are not trying to accomplish ministry through our strength. We only are trying to do what the Holy Spirit has led us to do and surrender and let God do what God does. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, I'm going to read verses 2 and 3. We've been talking about knowledge, so you're going to hear that here. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According, now listen to this, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto these two things, life and godliness. That power is given through the knowledge of God so that we will know how to live this life and how to live it in a godly fashion. But it says here, as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. And here's the point. Ministry has to be anchored in the power of God, not in personality. So what that means is that this ministry would be a pathetically weak ministry if Jeff Estes was to die and this church didn't stick by the word of God and do what it's supposed to do. Ministries are not supposed to be built 
on personalities. They're not supposed to be built on men. They are to be built on the person of Christ and the word of God. And it is that power that enables us to serve. Now, here's why I'm going to close with this. Many believers are stuck in a sense of powerlessness to serve. And I'm just trying to take a hammer to that and destroy that idea or that doctrine. God has given you all that you need to serve him. He has given you all the power you need. He will give you all the direction you need. Now, I'm, I'm going to take a moment here and kind of come back to spirit-led ministry. We do believe that God does give administrators to the church, overseers to the church, and they are called pastors. But pastors are to equip God's people to serve God as God directs them to serve. And in that partnership, the pastor works in a believer's life to help them know the Lord, to help them explore their growing in the nature of their walk with God. But all the power to do what God wants you to do is found in the Lord himself. So no man comes, and and by the way, there are all kinds of religions and charismaticism and false doctrine uh, or false religions that put a whole lot of authority on the empowerment of what man can give you. I, I, you know, even so much so that people are willing to buy a hanky, a white nose blowing cloth from someone who's a religious figure and think that it's got some kind of power. And all that cloth has power to be is how that pastor used it. It has no power. Nothing. And you don't need to compare yourself to somebody else. Well, I'm not, I'm not like them, so therefore I can't be as powerful in my ministry as them. God did not call you to be somebody else. He called you to be a follower of Jesus. And all the power that you have to do ministry is bound in his person. So just walk with God, surrender, live for him, and know that God absolutely will use you. And you may never have a title on the planet that says you were the director of whatever ministries. You were simply a servant of Christ. Well, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. By the word of truth... By the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, as it goes further, it goes into these two different flavors that are happening into the life of the believer. We're going to explore that further, Lord willing, next week. But as we close this message today, I want to I want to come back to this principle. I want to come back simply to this truth. It is God in His grace that has allowed you and has allowed me to be his servants. Can you go back to 2 Corinthians 4, 7 just as a, an end of the message? Do you, do you, can you this morning give thanks for an almighty king of kings and lord of lords, the great, the great king of all that has been created? Can you give thanks this morning that that God who has saved you, wants to use you in his ministry. And not only wants to, but can and can do things far beyond what you would ever think if you will just serve him. Yes, the ministry can be hard. Yes, the ministry can face a lot of different difficulties. But these are avenues in which we can accomplish ministry by avenues by which we can magnify Christ. But the question comes to our assembly this morning, Lord, how will I be your servant? How will I be your minister? But as we ask that question, there is an invitation back at all, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in what kind of vessels? Earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of who? Of God and not of us. I want you to take a moment here and just think about the bigness of God. 
So who are you that you should be saved? Who are you? But not only does God in his grace reach out to save sinners who come to him in faith, but he seeks to use them. Think of it this way. The almighty king of kings, by the way he has laid out the doctrine of the gospel and ministers, he is partnering with those he saves to now be the ambassadors of the truth of who he is. Who are we that we get to serve God? And who are we that in our future, for all of eternity, we will be the beneficiaries of God's grace, the beneficiaries of God's kindness, the continual exhibition of where mercy fell? Who are we? But these clay pots can glorify God, and we have that opportunity. May God's people give thanks, and may God's people rise to the occasion of ministry.